Well, hello, everybody, um, to our study of the books of Thessalonians here. I'm really excited to um, finish off these two letters tonight. We're in 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to be looking at um, chapter 2, verse 13, all the way through to the end. I went a little bit longer than I intended to go last time, so I'm going to try to keep it nice and short tonight, but even so... This short passage has so much packed into it, and I've really been um, impacted by studying and reading this um, this week with all the things that are happening with coronavirus. It's it's amazing how timely this is, I think, actually, for us. Paul is encouraging these young believers to hold on, to keep doing what they've been told to do, to not give up, to not grow weary, to not give in. And I think that that's certainly a place where I'm at right now in my life with this pandemic and schedules being changed and life, um, you know, not getting back to normal maybe when we thought it would. Um, And this passage is so encouraging. It's really, um, really blessed me. So I hope that I can uh, share some of those and just help you understand this short passage a little bit better. Um, There are some really familiar themes that we'll recognize from 1 Thessalonians and earlier in 2 Thessalonians. Those themes include thanksgiving, constant thanksgiving through constant prayer. Um, we see that here at the right at the beginning of um, our section. We have the theme of holiness, which I'm going to um, touch on and, and dig into a little bit um, in this video. We have the idea of the, th- the faithfulness of God. Um, on our behalf. So so we strive to be holy and to obey and to um, encourage one another, but ultimately it is God's faithfulness on our behalf working through us um, because of Jesus who upholds and does these things. And then finally, the huge theme of peace, which we're going to see right at the end of this letter. Again, Paul is writing to people who are in some tough times and he's really concerned for their peace not just as a temporary fix or some kind of band-aid but because he believes that is ultimately god's will for them as we saw in first thessalonians chapter 5. so let's begin we're just going to work our way through systematically i'm going to touch on just some of the things that stuck out to me most and things that i think um, should be considered The first one is this idea of holiness, which we see in um, chapter 2, verse 13. We've already talked about sanctification or holiness because we saw that theme in 1 Thessalonians. But one thing I haven't really dug into a lot that I want to help us think about more is the idea of the way that holiness is connected to the priesthood. Okay, So we know in 1 Peter um, chapter 2, verse 5, we read about priesthood of all believers, the fact that Jesus died in order that we might receive the Holy Spirit so that all Christians might function in one way or another as priests. So that kind of begs the question, how did priests function um, before Jesus for the nation of Israel? A simple um, kind of um, slogan or, or phrase that can help us remember, it's not perfect, but a simple way is that um, Prophets are the mouthpiece of God. So prophets communicate from God to people, right? Priests are kind of the other side of that um, communication. Priests primarily communicate and um, offer up sacrifices on behalf of the people to God. So think back to Moses and the tent of meeting um, and and the... um, the, Israelites who had just come out of Egypt, Moses had to approach God on their behalf. Uh, and, and then the priesthood, um, the Levitical priesthood, um, which of course was Aaron, Moses' brother, um, they functioned in that role as well, helping people offer sacrifices. So this is really interesting. If we're made holy by the Spirit, and um, if the priests had to be holy in the Old Testament, right, um, they had to do things differently and um they had certain rituals they had to follow because they were they occupied a unique role they had to keep themselves pure in order 
so that they could continue going into the, the tent, the tabernacle, the temple, to offer the sacrifices to God. What does that mean for us? Holiness, part of that word, means being set apart. And so as we think about our role as priests, um, we need to remember that we're not just being holy for ourselves. Um, we're being holy for others. And that holiness allows us to be a, to communicate um, pe- uh, people's kind of needs and hungers and desires to God. We act as this kind of bridge between people and God. And that's really cool to consider that Christians get that privilege. So I want us to just think about that as we um, study this passage. Another really cool um, uh, thing that's brought up in this passage is um, something we've seen before. Paul talks about um, the people imitating him uh, and and following his example. So we see this in chapter 2, verse 7. We see it in chapter... Um, sorry, chapter 3, verse 7. We see it in chapter 3, verse 9. Paul talks that he is an example to imitate, okay? Um, and we hear that a lot, so I think it might lose some of its um, um, emphasis sometimes to us. But when we consider what Paul also said in this passage, that they were living and sharing their very lives, um, Paul and Silas, when they were living among the the Thessalonians, and day and night, he says, they were laboring, day and night. And again, he says here in chapter 3, verse 8, and and I, it occurred to me that we sometimes think of imitation, especially in our social media culture, regardless of how many of you may be on social media personally, um, we have a lot of influencers or, or famous people and pastors and celebrities who people are trying to imitate. But actually, that's the exact opposite type of imitation that Paul is thinking about here because um, his he's encouraging imitation um, from the people who saw him day and night on the good days and on the bad days. And celebrities, famous people are completely separate from us. We never get to see the details, the minutia of their of their lives. But uh, Paul is encouraging them and I think as Christians in general, as, especially as um, Christian leaders, we need to think about Not just what we want people to see and imitate in our lives, but especially the things we don't want them to see. Day in and day out, night and day, um, what are the small things you do and how might people see those? Would would those small things make people want to know the God that you serve and and worship and follow? Everything from chores um, to, to relaxing and even handling conflict. Imitation is not just the stuff we want people to see, but it's the small stuff that we don't want people to see. How is your life um, looking in the small areas? Uh, This gets to the idea of integrity, acting in the same way no matter um, who is watching or no matter who we're around. Um, The next kind of idea that I wanted to touch on is um, in chapter 3, verse 13. Paul says, brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. And this echoes something else that Paul says in his letter to the Galatians, um, where he adds there, do not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest. Um, I think Paul's kind of probably building on this thought here that we see in 3.13. Um, and and he wouldn't have had to say it if people weren't growing weary, right? Um, personally, right now, I am starting to grow a bit weary, if I'm honest, in this time of coronavirus. Um, And I think we can grow weary for a lot of different reasons. But Paul says, don't be weary in doing what is right. And of course, he makes it clear that the things that are right are um, obeying the teachings of Jesus, the teachings that have been conveyed to them by Paul, and loving other people in the same way that Jesus loved them. That is such an encouragement, but it's also a challenge. Don't grow weary in doing what is right because God is helping us and God is is um, kind of energizing us in order to act in those ways. And ultimately, it's him who is working out those things, okay? Um, two more things that I wanna to touch on really briefly here. Again, I'm trying to keep it short tonight. But I was really struck by 
what Paul says in chapter 3, verse 15. Um, well, first we should look at 14. He says, Take note of those who do not obey what we say in this letter. Have nothing to do with them so that they might be ashamed. In 15, this is really cool, I think. Do not regard them as enemies, but warn them as believers. Wow, what a challenge. Because so many times in our day and age, I feel our political kind of atmosphere and some cultural issues and other things tend to be very um, polarized and kind of, I don't know, antagonistic or bipartisan and so easy to put people in that other camp and view, if not enemies, we view them as maybe the opposition or um, those other people, right? Um, but this, this message, this instruction from Paul is saying, look, you need to tell these people that they're in error you need to make clear to them that you don't approve of what they're doing, but do it in a way that shows there is still some understanding that you want them to come back because they like fellow believers, not as enemies, somebody you're trying to defeat. And for us as Christians, man, it's so easy to, to drift towards the way that our culture is, right? And trying to, to win or conquer or prove other people wrong. But we need to remember we're always operating from the love of God within us and always wanting people to come to God. And, and hopefully we're doing our best and, and to, to demonstrate God's love in our lives and, and act that out in holiness. So that's a challenge for us and I want that to definitely stick in our minds. The very last thing I wanna say, just notice is, Again, Paul kind of closes all this with peace. We, we saw so many times Paul has talked about peace and the peace of God that is um, given when we are um, connected to Jesus and, and, and following in his footsteps and living in the way that he wants us to. And here Paul kind of ups the ante, I think. We haven't quite seen the same ver um, language before, but in chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says, May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in all ways. Um, the Lord be with all of you. And of course, that's why we have peace is because the Lord is with us. He is among us. He is present. He is helping us. And so that idea that we have peace at all times and in all ways kind of just f closes this wonderful, um, these wonderful pastoral messages that Paul has has um, communicated to the young Thessalonians because in First Thessalonians we said uh, we saw you know he's telling them to um, pray without ceasing and give thanks always and and here he's saying um, he's saying that God will give them peace always in all times and in all ways and I think probably one way we can understand that is that we're all different and and we're in different situations in life and we need different um, types of peace or, or um, we need God to custom fit his um, gift of peace to us in a unique way because of what we're going through and God can do that and God knows exactly where you are and he wants to bring you and give you peace. So that's all. Um, I wanted to keep it very short tonight. I hope this has been helpful uh, and I'm excited to talk more about these things together. Bye.